Hi, Denisha. How are you? Okay. I'm good. How are you? You guys are going to absolutely hate me because um, I did not get a Kahoot ready for today. So, um, we're going to skip Kahoot today because we got a lot of stuff to cover, right? That's okay. Yeah, we do. We do have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, yeah. But um, I know that um, Alsh, Alsh likes to, um, you know, compete on the Kahoot. So, he'll be sad when he gets in here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Look like he's like. <laughs> Ash, can you hear me yet? Oh, he's there. Yeah. Hey, Ash. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Okay. Um, I was saying that you're going to be sad because um, I didn't have time to get the cahoots um, together, but we have um, a lot of stuff that we need to catch up on. So um, I'm going to try to get to as much as possible. Um, so we're going to, at the second half of this, um, do the, um, the labs. So, um, you know, uh, boot up your um, VMs, uh, your Kali, your um, broken web app, and your Windows. Because um, that'll be the second half of this after we talk about um, last week's um, lecture material. All right, so we are um, technically covering um, week 12 um, material today. Um, as I told you guys, I am seriously behind, but I will get it together soon. Um, so let's see. Um, nope, that's not the one I want. There we go. All right, so we are talking, um, we are on um, the tools at this point. Um, so we are on week um, 12. So we're going to be talking about um, stenography tools, which are basically hiding a picture um, inside of um, or hiding a message inside of a picture. Uh, we'll be talking about some malware detection tools, um, DOS and DDoS, um, web server security tools, web application security, SQL injection, wireless and Bluetooth, um, and then some other um, you know, Android, iOS, all of those are all um, uh, wireless type security um, tools for mobile devices and then also mobile device solutions. So um, we are working on the uh, week 12. All right, so stenography is the first topic um, up. Um, so this is basically a file hiding technique. Um, so you, it, it's basically the hiding of files in plain sight um, buried as part of an image, video or other files. Um, so I think um, we saw this in the lab, um, the last one that we had, um, where I showed you guys, you know, basically a message that was hidden in the Black Girls Hack logo, um, but you couldn't tell that it was there. So if you were to, for example, um, you know, look at the strings of it or look at the files um, of it in the command line, you would not see that there is um, something in there, um, but it's hidden within the message. So we've got a couple of tools um, for that. Um, some of the ones that you're um, books suggest are like Gargle Investigator, um, Steg Detect, which is not maintained at this time, um, which means that, you know, it's, it's, it, it may or may not work. Um, Spy Hunter, there's also um, uh, a Stego tool that comes native to uh, Kali, Open Stego. Um, and there's one other one um, that I'll, I'll show you when we get over to the lab, um, which is um, commonly used. Okay. So uh, any questions about any of the stenography or, or what it's about? Nope. All right, um, so, so next, uh, malware detection tools. So there are a lot of different tools that you can use to determine whether or not there's some malware inserted into um, a system. One of those ways is to be able to just look at the, um, uh, the file, so binary analysis or malware analysis. Um, there are a lot of different tools to do that. So some of the ones that they um, uh, mentioned in the book are actually like vulnerability um, uh, scanners. Um, so, you know, we looked at Nessus. Um, this is the one with the one week trial um, that we looked at a few weeks back. Um, there's also one called Qualys FreeScan. Uh, OpenVos is an open source. Um, it is the free version of uh, what used to be Nessus. Um, and then Process Hacker and Serverman um, are some of the other tools that you can use to be able to look at code um, to determine whether or not there's malware in it. 
Um, but generally, you know, I, I think we've mentioned before that the the uh, commonly accepted pro um, principle or process for looking at malware is to put it into a sandbox um, and then monitor what it is that is changing. Um, I wouldn't recommend that you guys do malware analysis um, unless it's something a part of like maybe a capture the flag, um, just because um, you want to make sure that you keep it, um, you know, remote to your your VMs. Um, so. Um, I do not know the best way to, to do that. So until you do, um, just keep yourself safe. All right, so um, DDoS and um, DOS protection tools. Um, so you guys have probably heard of some of these. Um, SolarWinds was actually um, in the news recently. Um, it's one of the programs that you can use to, um, you know, try to monitor for um, uh, uh, D. DOS or DDoS protection. Um, you may see Cloudflare in use. Um, a lot of uh, commercial sites use this. Um, I think I see this when I log into, I think it's Try Hack Me or Hack the Box, one of those. Um, you know, they do a check at first just to make sure that you're not, um, you know, part of a, a, a DOS or a DDoS attack. Um, some of the other ones is, are uh, security. Uh, Link 11, Stack Path, and AWS Shield. So um, you're on your exam. You'll basically um, they may ask you, you know, which one of these tools is is for use for something. Um, so the reason why we're going over all of these tools is so that you can see, um, you know, what they are, and just just try to have like some name association. So if you see, um, you know, a list of tools, you'll know, you know, maybe this one was wasn't one of the ones that I saw um, in that list. So. Um, and in, if you're using the Walker text, it is, um, uh, you know, in Appendix A, there's a list of tools that are um, separated out by section um, for you to be able to um, study them. All right, so patch management. Um, you, you may have seen a lot of um, some of these out here. Um, GFI, LandGuard um, is a, a solution that's out there for patch management, which is basically um, about testing um, uh, patches and then you know distribute them to um, a, a network. Um, Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. This is actually deprecated, so it's not used anymore. Um, ZenWorks Patch Management, which is an available solution. Um, Prism Patch Manager, <coughs> VMware vCenter, and Al Altiris are all some of the patch management tools that you might see out there in the wild. Um, I provide you the links for all of this, so in case you want to go and get these. Um, you can, some of them are commercial solutions, so they would cost money, but it's more so, like I said, on the exam, um, so that you can have some name recognition if you're, you get a question specifically asking about tools. Um, so if you guys don't remember, tools are basically 30% or, or so, um, 31% maybe it is, um, of your CEH exam. Um, so you should be prepared for a lot of different questions that are, you know, which one of these tools would you use in this situ situation, which one of these tools is for, you know, Stego, or which one of these tools is for patch management, those types um, of questions. Um, so that's why you should, um, you know, make sure that you're paying attention to um, what's going on here. All right, so next up is web server security tools. Um, so you've probably heard of some of these as well. Um, Retina, I think, is um, fairly popular out there, as is, I think, Fortify. Um, but you should just know that these are used to protect um, the web servers um, that are being served to people um, as they surf the internet. So Retina CS, InScan, um, NetIQ, uh, Secure Configuration Manager, Fortify, WebInspect, and then URL Scan are all different types of web server um, security tools. Um, so if you, you know, decide to leave a blue team life um, in the future, these are all tools that you might, um, you know, use for your um, network defense. All right, um, here's some more web application security tools. We're actually going to be talking about um, uh, Burp Suite today um, in our, our lab. Um, and they're also in Stalker, OWASP, Zed, um, Zap. Um, which you may have heard about, um, and Nikto. I think we used Nikto before, um, and if not, then I need to add this to um, the labs because this is something you should definitely see. Um, and then Nessus, and Nessus again is the um, the paid um, uh, application that we use for vulnerability scanning, um, and that we had like a one week trial for, to be able to use. So the one that's um, the paid version of Openboss. 
Um, so this is just another one of the web application security tools available. All right, so web application firewall. Um, they are basically, um, you know, as normal, the network and the host-based um, firewall applications. We also have a cloud-based um, uh, web application firewall. Um, and so these are basically firewalls that are used for web applications. Um, it applies a set of rules um, to the HTTP conversation. So um, any questions about any of that? All right, so um, some other um, web application firewalls. So we have um, Dot Defenders, um, Rad, Radware, Cloudflare. Um, this I think was in the news re recently, um, Security, and Fortinet um, are all um, solutions that are out there um, commercially available. Um, so S SQL injection detection. Um, we talked a lot about how, um, you know, if you wanna try to uh, do an SQL injection, um, you know, you need to make sure that if you're a developer of those of web, web applications that you are sanitizing um, and making sure that SQL cannot be um, injected to you know, allow for backend database manipulation. Um, but there are also some tools that are out there um, that help identify those. Um, so IBM Security AppScan, uh, SQLX, Snort, um, this is um, a big one that is used um, out there. Um, Burp Suite, which we're using today, and then W3AF um, is another type of web application um, security scanner that can be used to detect um, SQL injections. All right, um, wireless and Bluetooth security. Um, so as with most of the things on the exam, when it's talking about Bluetooth, you'll see either a BT in front or a um, blue in, in front. So those are really good at helping you to know that those are tools that are targeting Bluetooth um, uh, things. Other uh, devices include wireless security auditor, net cut, um, and then air magnet Wi-Fi analyzer. Um, and then like I said, the ones that say BT or blue scanner, um, just because it starts with the word blue, um, that'll help you to identify whether or not it's a tool that's specifically used for Bluetooth security. Um, but, you know, like I said, as, as security professionals, um, the best thing you can do um, with regard to Bluetooth is just turn it off if you're not using it. Um, you know, just because it's not, you know, super secure. Um, and there are a lot of different attacks, um, you know, basically all of the different attacks that you can do on a computer, you can do through Bluetooth. Um, so just make sure that you, you know, are practicing good security. All right, so mobile device um, security. Um, you know, we don't see this a lot, um, you know, just because most po folks don't pay attention to, um, um, you know, their mobile device security. Um, but just so you know, there's the Android Device Administrator API, um, which provides system level device administration, um, CSpolit, um, Analyzer, ImmuniWeb, uh, White Hat Security, um, which is also for Android, and then Blueborn, which is um, uh, scans for Blueborn attack vectors. And this is again related to, um, this one's actually related to um, Bluetooth. Um, so those are the, you know, um, different mobile device um, security that you might see out there on the web. There are some other ones, but these are ones that specifically um, our textbook says that um, are a possibility for um, EC Council to question us about. All right, so mobile device management solutions. So again, you might see something that just says MDM. You should just, um, as, as usual, just be aware of the acronyms. Um, there is the MASS um, 360, which is a mobile device management for endpoints and users and everything in between. Um, Mobi Control, SAP, Afaria, and Zen Mobile. Um, so these are all different device management solutions that are out there available for you. You really wouldn't need to know how to use these, just more so that these are different devices that are used in case you're asked the question um, about um, mobile device management. But I don't remember any questions like this, but it, it is on um, EC Council's um, outline. So just, just so you're aware. All right, and as I said, I did not get the Kahoot together. So we'll just take a look at um, our lab. All right, so the lab is actually a bit up on the um, blackgirlstech.org website um, for you to follow along if you want to. Um, don't judge me because we are several weeks behind, um, but 
like I said, I've been working on these for you. All right, so um, some of the tools that we're working on today um, are website update tools. There are a lot of different ones that are out there. Um, I'm kind of throwing these in as they relate to the topics that are um, that we covered. So this is actually from a few weeks ago. Um, so there's website update tools. Um, we're talking about trace route tools. We did a, a lot of trace route tools when we were over in our um, uh, Linux machines, but um, the trace route tools we're talking about today are available both in Linux and in Windows. So you can just see what those look like. Um, one of the ones we're looking at today is called um, a visual trace route and it's, it's pretty cool just to see um, how it works. But as with anything that you're doing in the ethical hacking realm, just be careful about what it is that you are um, using the tools for because um, you could be, be crossing some lines. Um, so also we'll look at some website mirroring tools. We'll start to look at those. Um, the one we're going to look at today is called WGET. Um, uh, Zydra, which is another tool, it's like um, FCRACK um, zip, which is used to do brute forcing on the command line um, of um, uh, PDF, RAR files, different um, zipped types of files. Um, we're talking about um, how you look at devices that are on the Internet of Things. Um, you can see whether or not, like, for example, your smart, you know, devices at home, your microwaves, your, you know, whatever, um, whether they're showing up. Um, we're going to look at take a look at Shodan. Um, which is, um, you know, for looking at specifically Internet of Things. And then we're going to go through um, some Burp Suite and some work on Wireshark within our actual, um, within our actual lab. Um, so that you guys can get a, a look at um, the use of Burp Suite and Wireshark. Um, because Wireshark is one of the things that you'll probably see a lot of on your, um, excuse me, on your exam, just as far as the, um, what's it called, um, like the filters, um, you know, the format of the filters, how you, you know, get certain information. Um, so um, before we get started on that, any, any questions so far? All right, so if you are, are new um, for our CAH, we have a lab that is set up. Um, the home lab basically has um, a broken web app, a Kali VM, and a Windows VM, um, and they're all connected on the same um, network. And I will actually just put mine onto the same network because I don't think that they currently are so that they can communicate. Um, but as usual, um, when you're doing, when you're on, have them all on the same network, you want to um, save them, um, put them all, all onto your net network if you're using VirtualBox. Um, I think it is um the zero um eth zero if you're using vmware um, but you want to make sure that they're all on the same network so that they can communicate and and to verify that you're just going to you know do a ping between the three devices just to make sure that they're still connected so i'm going to put my Kali, my windows machine and my broken web app and oh actually I, broken web app should never actually come off of the um the network okay so um i know that you guys have not had an opportunity to um, download some of these tools. So I'll show you the ones that require download on um, th through pictures. And you can, I included the instructions for how you can download them onto the machine. Um, so you can get those done. All right, but we're gonna look at change detection first. Um, so change detection is basically a website where you put in um, a, it allows you to basically stalk a website, okay? So let's say if you're looking for a, a job, right? So you wanna you know, do a search for all of the you know, uh, job updates. So maybe you'll, you would you know, track or monitor like jobs.netflix.com or something, right? So you can put anything in any website in here. So if we wanted to do, for example, black girls hack org in here, um, let's see if it's been scanned yet. Um, it'll basically, um, you know, scan to see when there's been changes and then it'll notify you, you know, for example, send notifications on a daily basis or a weekly basis or every five minutes or, you know, whatever it is that you're looking for, um, you know, and you have to find the section of the website that you're specifically looking for. So if we were looking for, um, you know, for example, the jobs, you would want to put this onto the jobs um, 
part of the section, um, but it lets you, as you can see, this is blown up pretty big. So it lets you get down to a very particular section so that you can see, um, you know, I guess some of the other um, use cases for this um, is if you are um, someone who's looking for um, shoe drops or, um, you know, video game drops or something like that, um, you could use this to be able to change when the website is updated. Um, but that, that's what this basically is, is, is um, uh, website monitoring. Um, another site that we're going to talk about in this, this section um, of website monitoring is called archive.org. Um, so you guys may not know it as archive.org. Um, this is actually the Wayback Machine. Um, so the Wayback Machine actually gives you information um, uh, on websites. So, you know, when they say that you, when you put something on the internet, you know, it, it, it never disappears. It, it's so true because, you know, anytime a website has been scanned, um, you can get the information, um, you know, it, it's stored um, on the Wayback Machine um, and it's archived. So I think they said that they're up to 500 billion web pages that they have the history for. So if we, for example, put in um, blackgirlshack.org, um, then it'll tell us, you know, the days, the specific days that updates were made to the website. Um, so, you know, you'll see that all of the updates have been basically made in 2020, and then it hasn't been scanned in 2021. Um, I, um, you know, tend to tell the uh, robots not to um, scan a lot of our, our site just because I don't want it being indexed, but the sites that are indexed, you can find out on here. So specifically on November 11th, there was um, a snapshot taken of the website. Um, so you can click on that and go back to the website as it was on that day in November 11th, 2020. Okay, so um, this has a lot of different implications just from um, ethical hacking perspective, just because, you know, let, let's say that a company had, for example, a spreadsheet up on their website um, that was available um, and that it leaked information. Um, you know, it may be in the, in the um, uh, what's it called? It may be in archive.org in the Wayback Machine um, so that you can see that it was actually there and be able to download it. You know, so even though they removed it or fixed it, um, you know, you can see how it was before. So they actually have three captures in between um, November 1st and November 20th of 2020. Um, but then again, like I, um, just for your information, you know, whenever you're doing, for example, like some web hacking, uh, um, you can go to the robots.txt of the website. So I'm looking at the robots.txt for, for Google right now. Um, and it basically tells you all of the, all of the um, uh, pages in its, um, uh, in its domain, all, all of the different um, folders that it doesn't want you to scan. So if I'm looking for some vulnerabilities or I'm looking for um, something to be able to um, you know, like to find something, if I'm doing a capture flag, for example, I'm going to use this as a starting point just so I can kind of see what is it that they don't want me to look at. Oh, you know, there's a, um, uh, uh, let's see, disallow products, okay, or product. So I would go and see what, you know, what Google slash product looks like, um, you know, or Google slash ebooks because they, they say disallow, they don't want you to see it. Um, Google slash patents, you know, that could be interesting if you were one of their competitors, um, because, you know, you see that those um, directories are available and Google has specifically said, I don't want you to, to take a look at those because this is the robots.txt. And most websites that you'll see out there in the wild um, have uh, robots.txt. If they don't have them, then maybe they don't care if the website is scanned. Uh, maybe they, they, you know, encourage it, but, you um, it's really depending on um, what the organization does. And as you can see from this list, it's it's pretty big um, just for, for Google's. Um, and, you know, and, and it's basically Google that's doing the, 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 the scanning of the web. Um, so the fact that, you know, they don't want you to actually look at themselves um, is, is interesting to me. So any, any questions about um, uh, the two things that we looked at, which was um, archive.org, which is a Wayback Machine, and then um, taking a look at changes to a website? Um, over time. No, all right. I will move on to the next thing. Um, so you'll 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 see this um, information in the slides about the I mean in the um, lab about this. Uh, the next one is pretty cool and I like it. It is called um, Visual Trace Route. So we did a trace route in our lab um, before, and you're probably not going to have the 
opportunity. I have to figure out which one of these I installed it on. Um, you're probably not going to have the opportunity to um, install it right now. Um, uh, no, that's not it. Oh, well, maybe this is the one. Uh, there we go. All right, so open visual um, uh, trace route. If you do a trace route on your um, machine, um, it'll basically show you, for example, if I wanted to say um, trace route and it's trace RT on Linux and trace um, R-O-U-T-E on Windows. So you just, just should just be aware that there are differences between the command lines for um, the commands for those two. So I think the one for Linux is trace root. Um, and then specifically, we're gonna look for our broken web app, which is, um, 14 today. I missed, I missed how you got to this, to that point. Um, um so if you say applicate, well, so the thing is you'll see the, in the instructions that you have to actually go and get, um, visual trace route. It's not, um, native. So okay. this is the place where you download it from. So you're not going to be able to download this, not on your computer, but once it, once you install it, um, then you can say, um, applications and then go to activities overview and then just start typing into, um, to tell it what it is you're searching for. So in this case, I'm looking for visual, um, this. If I was looking, for example, for like for a Steco program, I would say STG um, just to see what's on there. So I have some Steco files, but not, you know, any Steco programs on this particular VM. And you're so once you, through, you're downloading that through the Kali um, web browser? Yes, through the Kali web browser. So you want to make sure that, you know, for most of these things, um, you know, this came from visualtraceroute.net, um, you know, and it, I wouldn't download this to my, um, my host machine is what I'm saying to you. Um, so some of the things that it gives you, um, we'll say, show this in a second, but I just want to show you just so you can contrast. Um, so we said that the other one was 14. So, uh, okay. So maybe it's trace roots on. All right. So when you do a trace route on, um, a, so it, that means it's trace root R U T E on the Linux and trace R T on um, uh, a Windows, okay? So when you do a trace route, it basically tells you the number of hops that it takes to get from one location to the next. So in this case, we've only got three machines on our, um, uh, in our network, because um, that's the way that we set it up and they're in a ring. So, you know, you don't have to, there's a direct connection between each of the machines to the other machines, okay? So you don't have to, um, for example, take multiple hops, but like if we were to try to do this on a machine that's internet facing, for example, you wanted to trace your route to Google, you'll see, you know, maybe 20 um, different hops of different places that it starts, you know, starts or stops, whether those are network devices or whatever the case may be. But see, this is very boring. It tells you that there's one hop um, between um, my machine, which is um, uh, Kali to the broken web app machine. Okay. So now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do it in open visual trace route. Okay, so we're just going to put in um, the same IP address, which is the IP address of our broken web app machine, and then we're going to say go look. All right, so um, earlier when I did this, um, it was internet facing, and you'll see specifically that it told me that I was in Alexandria. Um, it gives you, for example, the latitude and the longitude, um, the IP address. It gives you a lot of information specifically about the machine. Um, because I put it back on the network, it may not um, give us this. And let me just make sure that this is, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, it may not give us the information. Um, and, and let me just real quick, just put this back internet facing just so you can see what it looks like because I, I think it's pretty cool. Um, pretty cool in the stalkery kind of way. All right, so let's try this again. All right, so then it starts looking and, you know, it's trying to figure out where in the world that you're at. Um, so after a while, it'll specifically show you that I am doing this from 
Alexandria and it'll tell you like the, the town and the host name and the latitude and the longitude um, and what country you're in. So, you know, if you see, for example, a lot of traffic from a particular site, um, when you're doing network sniffing, you can use this to um, try to find it out. Uh, all right, it's not picking up. Uh, let me just put this back so I can finish the rest of the lab. Um, but you can see in the um, screenshot that it basically shows you specifically where I'm at in the country, um, in Alexandria. Um, and then it shows you latitude, longitude, information, host name, um, and as well as some other things as well. So this is um, a different tool that you can use, but it's, it's still pretty cool. Um, so any questions about that? Oh, um, you can also get who is information um, from the IP address that is um, in there. So this actually tells you, for example, that I'm using um, Cox.net. You know, it tells you what the name service. It gives you basically information about the IP addresses. So you can see that this would actually be a, a pretty dope, um, you know, tool for getting um, information about an IP address. So like if you just have an IP address as a starting point, you can find out information. Um, so like this specifically says, you know, information for Cox, um, but you know, you may get someone's personal, um, you know, external facing IP address and be able to actually find out where they're at if that's what you were looking for. All right, so the next thing that we're doing is um, website mirroring. So you can actually do this one if you want to. Um, Hydra is not a um, tool that is, I'm sorry, Zydra is not a tool that is on our machine, um, our Kali machine natively, but you would have to download this from the internet. Um, so I will just show you because I have already um, gotten it, um, that, but you can just copy and paste the, the wget in there. It's not gonna do anything because um, I already um, got this down here. So if you say ls, you should see in there a Zydra dot, PY, um, it's an uppercase. So one of the things that you're going to have to do when you download this is do the um, uh, see this command here, move Zydra to little Zydra is just to make it um, a lowercase. Um, and then so when you, you use the other commands, it'll work um, because the file that downloads is, is uppercase, but then you know all of the commands were, were lowercase. So you just going to change that file into a lowercase. Zydra, and then what you can do is you can run this with um, Python 3 specifically. So um, you can download, and I included the lit name of a common password, um, uh, uh, common word list file here, this wget, but basically that's what wget does. It basically pulls information down from the web. So it's like the equivalent of, for example, going to do like an app get install you know, where it pulls it down from, um, you know, the Kali um, repo, uh, it's probably already in there, but for things that are not already there, you can use wget um, to be able to get them. So this tool specifically is um, for you to be able to um, do password cracking on cer certain types of files. So this is the usage. Um, and then I also included a location where you could get some uh, sample um, uh, files that are password protected that you can download to do, run this tool along. Um, but again, do this on your um, Kali machine, you know, do this on under your, your VM, um, you know, while it's internet facing and then put it back onto the network so that um, you don't have to worry about, you know, installing something, getting something onto your host machine. Okay. So, you know, when you get ready to run it, you run it um, using the usage which is here, usage, Python 3. Um, so you can just tape, tape, pipe, uh, put this directly into your command line um, and that it will unzip or tell you what the password is for this file. Um, so maybe like a, a lot of weeks ago, we also used another tool um, called fcrack zip, which does the same thing, which is password cracking. So if you do any um, capture the flag type things, you're gonna wanna make sure that you, you know, add Zydra to your, um, arsenal of tools that you can use. Um, for example, if fcrack zip is not working. All right, so any questions about using that for um, cracking um, zip files? No? All right. Does it crack, um, hey, finish the, uh, Zydra, does it, does it crack only text files or also PDF files too? 
Um, so this one actually does um, PDFs, uh, zips, um, basically any of the RAR files. Um, when I actually ran it, I think I ran it using um, a, a RAR file um, just to make sure that it actually um, worked. Um, but like I said, you have to, um, I had, in order for me to get these tools, I had to take them off of the, um, the network and, and get them from out of the internet. So you're going to have to do a little bit of setup, um, but you can do PDF files as well. But, you know, as we see when you do, for example, like um, some of the uh, web, web application enumeration, like mm -hmm. you can get different results from different tools. So we may use um, Derb and get one set of results. And then we may use, for example, GoBuster and get another set of results. So it's always good to have, you know, multiple tools in your um, arsenal that you can, you know, use for, you know, if you, you find a file that's um, password protected, so. All right, no worries. All right, so next up is the internet of things. So this is um, Shodan.io and I can actually show you this on my machine. So Shodan.io um, is uh, Internet of Things for search engines. So basically, if you have a thing in your house, so think um, uh, internet connected devices. So let's talk, say an Xbox, let's say a webcam, um, let's say um, a Nest or a microwave, or if you have a smart refrigerator or smart oven, any of those devices that you can tell the lady that's behind me and listening for me, um, to like your smart assistants to um, turn on, turn off or do something with, those devices are connected to the web, okay? So when you, when you um, do that, you wanna make sure that the devices are not being connected. Okay, so let's say if we wanted to do a microwave. So this will actually tell you um, a, a, link, a list of places where people have microwaves and they're connected to the web, okay? So um, you'll see that um, Czechia um, has the most people. The United States has um, uh, a lot in, within the country, um, as does Brazil and South. So you can actually, um, depending on the device, and I'm not clicking on any of these um, on purpose, um, because like some of the, you know, a lot of this is, is uh, private information. Um, but if you're doing a, a target for, if you're doing an ethical hacking, um, uh, engagement for a company, right? And they've got like, let's say some smart printers. Okay. You might want to let them know like, Hey, I can see your smart printers from the web. You know, I can find, um, banner information. I can find, you know, whatever it is that's available out there for that machine. Um, so like this tells you specifically that the, at this IP location, that there's a Samsung, um, stainless steel electronic microwave. Okay. So with that type of information, if I know I'm attacking this, this, this place, you know, I can, you know, find out exploits that are specifically for this type of thing. This is just gives me another attack surface that I can try to, um, uh, exploit. Okay, so that's what Shodan IO is basically. It's uh, where you can find out, um, you know, about, for example, microwaves, or if you wanted to do something like, uh, let's say, refrigerator. Um, if I know how to spell refrigerator, I do not. So if you've got a smart refrigerator, you'll see that there are a lot of these in the United States. Um, some of them are transmitted over HTTP, you know, which is uh, fairly secure. Some of them are not transmitted um, over HTTPS. So they're not as secure. Okay, so if you're looking, targeting a specific, um, you know, IP address or uh, IP segment, this is something that you might want to look at um, to see whether a company has devices that are leaking information. Um, so any questions about Shodan? All right, next up. Uh, so we are going to actually go into our Windows VM um, and we're going to uh, take a look at some of the um, like Burp Suite and Wireshark. Um, all right, so I included the instructions in here. So making sure that your network is on that network if you're using it, um, but I'll basically show you how it looks. And then if you want to, you can um, do this along with me or you can wait until you um, 
get everything set up into your thing. So all of this stuff should be ready to go if your uh, machine is up, but you may not like be home, for example, um, and be able to do this. So I will just show you what it looks like um, on my machine. If my machine decides it wants to cooperate. All right, so um, we have uh, seven for our broken, I'm sorry, for our Cali machine. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. So 10.0.2.7 is Cali. Um, and then you want to figure out which your um, Windows one is. All right, hopefully that'll bring up, and then you have your broken web app, which we already know is 14. So fourteen, and then the other one, um, the Windows is 10.0.2.27. And I just know that because I configured it. Um, you can say IP config in here, and it should tell me what I already know, see horrible machine. Um, this is 15. So it must be the other one that I did. All right. So this is 15. Um, so what we want to do is we want to ping the other two just to make sure we can get access to them. So we're going to ping the Cali machines 10.0.2.14. And hopefully this works. All right. That tells me that this is not the right VM. Oh, it eventually did work. All right, so maybe I can use this one. Ping. How did you find um, the um? How did how did you find the uh the um? The command terminal. The, no, the the Windows uh VM the, the uh. What you call it? The. Oh my God, I'm blanking. Um. Shoot. IP address. Sorry. Oh, um. So uh, I IP config on a Windows machine. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to ping 10.0.2.7 and hopefully this works. Yay. And then we're going to ping from the uh, Cali machine 10.0.2.15. I think we said it was. Oh, it would help if you just said ping. All right, so these are all connected. They're all on the same network device, which is absolutely beautiful because that's what we want. All right, so our um, Cali machine, I'm sorry, our broken web app machine is 14 and our Windows machine is 15. This is for mine, yours is going to be different, but I'll just show you what this looks like. All right, so we're gonna put in here 10.0.2.14, which is our broken web app machine, um, which is gonna take us to the web server that is being hosted on our um, broken web app machine. Okay. So, um, the whole purpose of broken web app machine, if you are new, um, is that the broken web app is intentionally vulnerable VM. Um, it has a web server that you can actually practice the OWASP, um, which is the open web, um, application security project, um, top 10. Um, so these are the common vulnerabilities that are found on, um, uh, websites. Um, so we're specifically going to take a look at the OWASP web goat, which is here. Um, and then I provided to you the pass usernames and passwords, which are common information. Um, you can do a Google search for them. Um, so it's WebGoat and WebGoat is the administrator. There's also a guest guest, um, but I included all those passwords on your write-up. Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it sounded dramatic. Yeah, I'm dealing with the broken web app thing. I'm trying to follow along here. But, um... Okay. So where where are you at? I I um I was putting in my username and um the the login credentials for the broken web app. Okay, and did it not work? You put it, you typed it in wrong. Uh, yeah, I put the wrong. Thing 
Okay. All right. So when we get in here, um, give me one second. My husband is hilarious. I guess he just found an IP address, I mean, a password that's not very secure. So he, he sent it to me just to mock my life. Um, <laughs> what's, what's the, you what's the, um, login stuff again for that? Uh, WebGoat and WebGoat. No, for, uh, broken web app. It's WebGoat and WebGoat. What do you mean? Oh, uh, oh, to get into broken web app, it's root and then OWASP WAP. I'm sorry, OWASP BWA, but it's actually on right before the login. Um, it, it actually tells you so, but it's root ROT and then the, the password is see where it says OWASP BWA um, root at th that's the password OWASP BWA. I realize I'm not enunciating appropriately, which is why I'm pointing and you can't see me pointing. All right. Um, so, um, all right. Um, so we're going to start WebGoat. So you're just going to click on here to start WebGoat. Um, and so, like, like I said, WebGoat is set up as a tutorial, um, but it is several years old and it is not maintained. Um, but most of the things you can still get through in here. Um, so some of the exercises that we set up um, that I set up for us to do um, were specifically the access control flags. Um, and um, so we'll take a look at that one and then we're going to do look at, into Burp Suite, okay? Um, because I have found recently that a lot of folks have not been able to use or have, have not used Burp Suite before. Um, and it is absolutely essential if you're doing any type of um, web application testing. So we're gonna click on the access control flaws and then just click on the first thing, which is um, the access control matrix. So the purpose of this, um, uh, exercise here is to be able to get access to um, the um, admin account manager resource. Um, so for example, if you say, you know, Mo is public share and say check X access, it'll basically say, hey, the user Mo um, was allowed to access the, the resource public share. But the goal of this exercise is to get um, one of the users access to the account manager. So if we click on Mo and account manager, we'll see that Mo does not have privileges necessary to access the resource um, account manager. So what we're going to do um, real quick is we're going to um, click on this um, open menu here, if you're following along, um, and then say preferences. And we're going to pull up the proxy menu because we're going to turn our proxy on. Um, so you're going to click on type in proxy in the search window and you're going to say settings. Um, and then you're gonna say manual proxy configurations. You're gonna to wanna to make sure of two things. And number one is that this is your home address, which is 127.0.0.1. Um, and that the port is 8080, okay? So those are the two things that you're going to make sure of um, under man manual proxy configuration. And then you're gonna say, okay. Okay, so um, now we're going to kick off Burp Suite. So Burp, Burp Suite is um, a tool that uh, allows you to be able to intercept, to do man, man in the middle, um, to look at cookies, to look at the trap traps being sent back and forth from a website um, so that you can, um, uh, you know, be able to, to, to look at the web traffic, okay? So this basically intercepts um, the traffic that you're sending to it so that um, you know you can be able to manipulate it. So you can either see it and change it um, you know, midway before it goes, or maybe you can um, just drop it so that they don't even get even get the message, like you know, what message. All right, so once you get into Burp Suite, um, you can click on proxy. Um, and then we're going to on the options make sure that this box is check it on proxy listeners because otherwise you will get an error message about it not listening. And this basically tells it the same thing that we configured in our pro proxy configuration, which I still left open on purpose. Um, so that you, you're looking specifically on the home on port 8080. Okay, so we're going to turn the intercept on um, in a minute. But before I do that, I wanna come back here and start over with Mo in the public share. All right, so gonna turn the intercept on. And when I do that, I'm going to refresh the page and it says, hey, I got to resend this. So when it does that, um, we're going to say check access and hopefully our burp suite is going to pick this up. 
So it's picking up something, but it did not intercept it. Oh, wait, intercept is one. All right, let me try it now. Okay, so it did intercept it now. So when Burp Suite intercepts it, you'll see that the page is, um, if you can see right here, it's like moving back and forth, like it's hanging. The site's not really hanging, it's just waiting for us to decide what to do. Okay, so if someone is doing a man in the middle attack on your um, network, this is basically the type of thing they're doing. They've intercepted um, a packet, they're going to change it. So let's say um, this, this person was actually sent, was actually Mo, but I'm going to change this to Larry, okay? so. As you, as you can see here, the message says user Mo was allowed access to the re re um, resource public share. But what I'm going to send to the, the web server is actually um, about Larry. So when you get in here, it says, hey, Larry, who is a user and a manager, does not have privileges to access the public share, okay? But maybe Larry has access to something else. So you'll find if you play around with this enough that Larry actually has access to the account manager. So when you do that, it'll get hijacked by your burp and you can forward it. Um, and then it'll basically say, congratulations, you've successfully completed this lesson. But the purpose of the lesson is for you to be able to look at the, um, the message that is sent between the web server and burp suite um, so that you can manipulate it because the rest of the activities that we're going to do um, are basically requiring us to manipulate data that is being transmitted back and forth between um, the website and the web server. Okay, so any questions about that so far? No? Okay. All right, so I'll just show you one more um, and then, and I think that the one that I wanna show you is here. Oh yes, okay. So um, this one um, I think is interesting just because this is one of the common um, web vulnerabilities that you'll see um, in purposefully misconfigured. I hope that they don't have a lot of these in the wild, but I'm sure that they do. Um, so the purpose of this exercise is to be able to view the file. So as you can see, it tells us that the current directory is var tomcat6 um, here. Um, and then it sends a file, okay? So right now it's doing a um, off by one.html um, and then it's submitting it. Okay, so we're just going to forward that on and it's going to say, hey, this file is already allowed in the directory. Okay, so the purpose of this exercise is actually to be able to access the file that is not um, in the directory for viewing. Okay, so all of these files that are in here are actually allowed. Okay, so but they want you to what they want you to do is to find the Tomcat users.xml file. Um, which is in another directory that you don't have access to. So we're going to use um, directory traversal in order to you know, get to that directory. So a couple of, of comments, okay? So if you were to take a look on your computer, um, your um, Kali machine right now, um, and do a search for um, Tomcat, you will see that uh, locate. You'll see that um, Tomcat on our um, VMs um, are not the same version as um, the version that's on the on the machine. So um, this is actually on my this machine. It is. Uh, let's see if it shows me. Maybe it's the other machine. Oh, actually, no, it's not because it's, it shows you here. Um, they're actually on version Tomcat six. Um, so we're going to just search for this file so you can see. Um, where it is. Let's see if that'll work. And I just want to search for the tomcat-users.xml file, see if it's on the system. And it's not showing up, but it is. Um, let me just show you um, in the directions I included on here. Um, I went through the process of showing you um, how to basically beat this level. Um, and, and it's basically a trial and error, what you're gonna to wanna to do. Um, the file is located in the Tomcat 6 folder, not the Tomcat, because like I said, this hasn't been updated, um, but the VMs have. So the VMs are currently have a, an Apache web server that's at level six for Tomcat, but the instructions, um, still say that it's on just Tomcat. So you have to, to make the adjustments, but I included um, in the instructions, um, the actual um, command that we need to use. 
So if you trial and errored and played with this for a little bit of a while, you'd see that you can submit this um, as off by one. And then we're going to update it so that it's looking at um, Tomcat 6.x, and I need to put XML in here. I remember that from last time. Um, and then submit. So when we do that, um, and then we forward it in, it says, congratulations, we got access to the Tomcat users file. And that's the purpose of this exam. I mean, the purpose of this, um, this level is to be able to access. So you wouldn't actually be able to figure this out unless you had some information about um, where um, in the directory the Tomcat users XML file is, is typically um, held. And the reason why this is important because Tomcat users tells you the people who are able to log into the Tomcat server. Okay, so um, this is like one of the exercises and I included the step by step instructions on how to do it and how you get to this is the answer, um, because you'll find out that when you do a search to figure out where Tomcat users in it's typically in the Tomcat folders, which is um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, layers above where we're, we're starting at. And so we're starting at the current directory is bar lib tomcat six, right? So you'll see one, two, three, four, um, four levels right here, um, just to start with, okay? Um, and then actually this folder, this, this file right here is actually gonna be in the English folder. Um, so we have to go up um, what turns out to be seven to seven levels um, so that we can be able to access the the file that they're, they're looking for. Um, so the reason, like I said, the reason why you care about this is that Tomcat users are where the users are normally um, found. So if a website is subject to, um, excuse me, um, the this bypass um, access control scheme um, issues, if you can, you know, do directory traversal, um, then it'll allow you to access things that you shouldn't have access to. Okay, so the cool thing about this is that as you beat the levels, it turns them green with the green check book, green check mark. Um, excuse me, so some of the um, levels are, are broken, um, but if you refresh, then you should see the check mark. Okay, um, and, and like this is, um, all of these levels are available um, online um, and there's also a lesson plan. But I think that um, when I first was exposed to this a few years ago, the lesson plan um, was in flash. So I don't think it's updated, which means you probably can't access them. But there's a lot of write-ups online about how to do the different levels. Um, so as you can see, there are you know probably a hundred different levels that you can um, try to do that all are on different um, uh, different areas of the OWASP. Um, so one of the ones that you'll see um, if you decide to do um, uh, the OSCP um, is buffer overflows. So this talks about, you know, one off by one overflows, but you can check out some of the other um, insecure web app um, application. Um, so you can just, you know, get practice with, with executing these types of things. Um, because one of the things that you, that we do as a part of our ethical hacking process um, is that after we do, you know, our vulnerability scanning to determine what's, what, what um, servers are on the machine after we're done with our enumeration, um, we check to see, you know, what these um, uh, applications are vulnerable to. So if they're vulnerable, for example, to an access bypass or um, directory traversal, then you'll know, hey, I just need to add a whole bunch of dot dot slashes in the URL to be able to get to where it is that I'm trying to go. Okay. So does, does that make sense to you guys? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. All right. And like I said, I included step-by-step -step instructions so you can go through this because I realized that um, you know, you, you, I went through it pretty fast. Um, and like I said, if you tried to do this, you know, you'd first start off and then you'd say, hey, I'm looking for the Tomcat users.xml. Um, and I know it's in the Tomcat folder, which is in Etsy now. So I'm going to do that one level. And then it'll tell you like, hey, you're still six levels away. So after trial and error, just, you know, keep adding dot, dot, dash as you find that it's actually whatever this number, I think it's a seven number of levels away from where you start off at. And it tells you the levels that you start off at here by current directory. Okay. All right. So I think the other thing that we were going to do in here um, was turn off Burp Suite and then we're going to go to uh, Wireshark. Okay. So um, you're going to turn off, I'm sorry, the proxy is what you want to turn off. So go to no proxy and say, okay, 
and we're going to go back to the web web goat and then we're going to launch wireshark so you could do that um by clicking on the the matrix at the bottom um, and just saying wireshark and you can pull it up all right so we've talked about wireshark before um probably quite a few times but it's very important to your exam um, because i feel like if I did not already call the CEH the NMAP test, it would be the NMAP and Wireshark test, okay? So we're going to just turn on the capture just by clicking the shark fin, and then it's gonna start capturing things that we're doing in the web. All right, so we're going to refresh this and it's gonna to wanna to resend it. So when it does that, it sends all of our web traffic um, to this specifically, okay? So you'll see that there is both HTTP HTTP traffic as well as other things just based on what we're doing. Okay. And let's see where I was going with this. Um, okay. So basically just so you can be able to see, you know, what's going on um, in the traffic. So we're going to, the first thing I usually do when I get in here is I will do a follow in TCP stream. Um, and this is basically going to tell you what happened. Okay. So what this tells us is that, um, the user was accessing um, WebGoat, which is at 10.0.2.14. They were looking at a screen 57 and, and menu 200, which is the last thing that we were doing, okay? So it tells you um, that information um, just in the, um, you know, the header of the TCP stream, which is basically all of the TCP traffic that was done um, that were associated this. So, you know, some of the things that we commonly look for when we're looking at Wireshark is the sin, synac, and then the act. So this is actually a three-way, um, a, a three-way handshake. So what you can do is you'll you can click on this and you can say right click and just say when you say um, uh, what is it? Uh, that's not what I want. All right, view conversations. Um, you can see that the conversation in, in here was over IP version four, and it involved 10.0.2.3, um, just trying to find out you know, who had this, this, um, and then 10.0.2.7, which is our um, Kali machine talking to the um, broken web app machine. So most of this conversation here was between um, these two machines. So there were 82 packets that were sent and that was just basically the information that was um, sent for me clicking refresh. So you'll see that that produced, um, you know, 158 package, right? Um, and you can, depending on the filters. So like if you wanted to say, hey, I only wanna see the information between these two IP addresses, which is our Kali machine and our broken web app machine, you would say, um, IP dot ADDR equals equals, which is important, um, 10.0.2.7. And then we want, um, don't know where the ampersand is. And IP dot address equals 10.0.2.14. So what this is going to do, if I put two equal signs in there the way I'm supposed to, is to show you all of the traffic just between these two um, machines, okay? So if you know that whatever you're looking for happened between these two machines, then you know you could just filter this. Um, and these specific types of questions, like for example, how to filter an IP address is something that I've seen on, on the exam. So basically um, you wanna put in here, um, just know that it's IP dot address and then the thing. You can also do, for example, a, Destination dot address. So D, I think it's DST. Let's see if that's right. It's not. Yeah, but you should basically figure out what the actual destination is um, for the IP address. Um, IP dot D. Oh, IP dot destination equals. And this should get rid of everything that's not directly sent to 10.0.2.14. Because we, if we know, for example, like if we're doing a capture of the flag, that the, um, the whatever it was that we're looking for was received specifically by 10.0.2.14, we can filter out you know traffic that was specifically between these these two IP addresses. So we could have left it at you know IP address equals this and IP 
it, it was this and that or would have given in traffic between the two play, the, two um, hosts. But by specifically saying that the destination is this, this gets rid of any of the traffic that was sent in the opposite direction. Okay. So um, in, any questions about any of that? Let me see if there's anything else I was supposed to tell you. Um, we're going to look at the conversations, which we did. IP address filter. I have a question in regards to Wireshark. And, um, sure. So you just turned on Wireshark and it was able to pick up what you had done already, or did you do something, is something in your, going on in your, in the background? Like what? Okay. You yeah. So a lot of traffic going and I'm like, I, I turn on mine and I don't have as much traffic as you got going on. Yeah. So what you, what you want to do is, is when you kick off, um, so let's say we're going to close this real quick. So when we kick off, um, uh, Wireshark, this is where you're left with, okay? So I just happen to know that my traffic is on ETH zero, okay? So if I wanted to, I could just click on this and specifically look at this. But when you click on the, the shark, it basically captures all of your network interfaces, okay? Oh. So anything that it basically sees, um, it's going to pull up. So you may see some traffic that's on, like, for example, my host machine or something, um, oh. which is possible because, like I said, it's picking up anything that is in this list, okay? So you'll see right now that if we already use any, there's traffic that's being transmitted. And then if I were to use ETH, there's um, ETHO, there's traffic that's being transmitted, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna start capturing. And then, like I said, just refresh the page and it'll say resend. And then it sends, you know, this time 137 um, packets, you know, in whatever it was that I was doing. Okay. All right, so I think that that was it for um, this uh, lab. Um, like I said, I'm still a few labs behind, so I'll start adding those to our, our future lessons so that we can catch up. I think we've got maybe three more weeks left. So um, all of these sections are basically tools um, anyway, The even week 13 um, is just tools. So like I said, I, I, I've been putting these tools in um, as we've been going along over the course of the, um, you know, I guess, 13 weeks so far. So you have a lot of these tools um, that, um, you know, in the past lab. So like, if you feel like you've missed um, a particular type of um, tool, you know, I would take a look at this list because I tried to keep it updated so you can see what we've done um, in the past, at this point, nine weeks um, of, of labs that are out there. Um, so I've been working on the other ones, like I said, so I'll be adding those into um, our future. So we'll get um, the week 13 um, slides next week, and then I'll try to throw in two of the other labs so that we can get, um, you know, make sure that you guys get exposure to those. Um, one thing I will say that I actually just saw recently um, is that, and we did not cover, is there is a difference between doing a, a um, in map specific number of um, packets scan on windows than it is in in um in linux so does anyone know like if i wanted to send exactly six packets in um linux what the command is for nmap no any guesses no okay all right so if you wanted to send exactly six pa packets you're actually going to do a dash c um let me find my cali machine so in, oh, I'm sorry, ping, is it ping? So if I leave this alone, um, then it should give me exactly six packets. Um, if you did not put the dash C in there, then ping will go forever and ever and ever. And then you'll come back and wonder why your computer crashed. Okay. So this is why I always say press control C after you start the ping, because we normally don't tell them how many packets to do. Um, but this is one of the things that um, I've seen recently um, that has popped up. So um, the dash C is what you use for ping on a Linux machine. But if you are on a um, Windows machine, it is um, the same thing, but a dash in. So you should just be aware of that in case you see that um, on your exam. All right, so that's all I have um, for today. Um, any questions? Yeah, I, I was um, for the open visual trace route. Mm -hmm. um, so I downloaded it, right? And I'm trying mm -hmm. to execute the, uh, 
the program, but it's given it's, it's given me an error. Like so, someone... if you go in here um, after you down, did you download it already? And yes. So it finished on the command line. No, well, I downloaded it from the from from the uh, from the browser, right? And then um, so I go to my downloads folder inside Cali and, and uh -huh. try to execute it from there, and it's giving me an error saying that. So. Uh, oh, you know what it might be? Um, so the first time I, I got it, I thought that I had um, uh, 86. So I downloaded this and the error that I got specifically said that, hey, this is not compatible with my version of, of Cali, which is actually a 64. So then I had to download this one. Um, oh, so it may yes. be, what is okay. the error? No, no, I know what I did. Is that the error? I, yeah, I know what I did. I was supposed to okay. put the, the Linux uh, 64. I, I, I put something else. I, all right, I got it. Okay, but just DM me if you have any issues and we could take, um, take a look. Um, but that's all I have for, um, for this week. Um, if there are no questions, then I will see you guys, um, you know, next Monday and we will continue to play catch up. I have a little question. Sure, please. Uh, yeah, you was talking about one tool that is called GoBuster. I, yes. I have working in Try Hack Me, but I didn't know what is really doing this tool. Can you explain me in your words uh, what, what sure. you can do with this tool, please? So um, uh, GoBuster is actually, so um, if you're looking at a web application and then you say, for example, let's say derb um, uh, HTTP. So there's a web server we know on our broken web app um, and we're going to run this and we're going to see um, what um, hidden directories are on there. When you get to a web app, you don't know what it is um, that is on there. So what you do is you run a tool like um, Derb or GoBuster to find out what the hidden directories are on the machine so that you can see um, what might be on there for you to be able to explore, okay? So the reason why I use Derb instead of GoBuster is because Derb, um, I'm sorry, GoBuster has like a specific, um, it's not just a uh, Go, you know, Derb and then the IP address. Um, it's actually like, you have to have like a dash U and I don't have that on here, but we, we talked about it on one of the previous weeks. Um, but basically it goes through and it tells you what directory. So the, it, it says specifically, there's an icon directory, there's an images directory, there's a JavaScript directory. So what that, what that information that that gives us is that if we're here and we see, for example, we're at this website and we're like, hey, so it tells me that there's an images um, directory, right? So I can click on images and see, oh, there's these, there are these images here. Maybe they don't want us to see this, okay? So then you can download these pictures and be able to look at them. But you wouldn't know that this images directory was here um, because it's not uh, uh, publicized, okay? So like I said, whenever I get to something where I'm doing a web application to uh, test, I'll say uh, robots.txt so I can see um, whether or not um, there's anything, and, and in this case, there is not. Um, but like I said, when we did the other one where we did of uh, Google, it showed you all the things not to allow. So there's no way when you get to this um, website to know, you know, where where it is that you're supposed to be looking at. Um, so let me just go back. All right, so we're here, and this is a web go directory. So if we go back and look in our terminal, it'll basically tell us, like, it'll do a common scan, um, and it's searching against 4,600 um, word lists in the common.txt, and it basically says, you know, hey, these are some of the um, uh, directories that you should look at. There's a Joomla folder. Um, there is a robots.txt. Oh, see, look, it, the robots.txt file is actually off of the, the Joomla. Um, so you can go and check that out, see what it doesn't want you to look at. Um, there is a PHP, PHP um, folder, upgrade folder, you know, so when you're doing, for example, like a try hack me or something where you're looking for specific information, you want to try to see what directories are hidden. So that's what tools like um, GoBuster and, and Derb um, do is it tells you um, what uh, files are included um, on the, that are hidden, that may be hidden on the directory. So this is still searching, um, but it's going to come up with a whole bunch of answers. And then when you run, um, for example, GoBuster, you'll get another set of examples, but you need to look up what the, um, uh, the command line uh, tool, uh, command line, uh, what it looks like. So let me just show you. Um, So 
So Go Buster looks something like, uh, so that's what it is. So it's like Go Buster and then um, dash E dash U. I, I don't have time to remember all of this stuff, right? Um, so if we copy and paste this, we should be able to do, and I'm just gonna cancel this and I'm going to paste this new one. And I'm going to change this to the IP address that we are actually looking at, which is 10.0.2.14. And then I'm going to run it um, dash E dash U W user share word list derbs common. Um, see, and this is why like, it, it takes a while for you to figure out what the exact um, command line uses is. Um, which is that? The extra splash in the end after 14. Can you please take it out? Let's see. I'll take the extra. I see what you're saying. Hmm. Unknown hmm. command for GoBusters. Let's see if I can get rid of the dash E. Um, I included this in a lesson the other day. That's why it's coming up in my searches um, where it was actually. I actually got it working, so I included it for you in one of the labs. But this is why I always use derp instead of go buster. Yeah. But basically, it's going to give you, like I said, the same exact type of results. It'll give you the common um, uh, directories that are off of the website, so that you can know, for, for example, if there's a, a hidden login page, or if there's a hidden, you know, blog, or there's a hid hidden password portal, or something. I don't know. Um, but that's basically what it's for. So you can see um, what options are because otherwise you're going to be sitting here. Like if you wanted to sit here and go one by one, oh, let me see if there's an admin um, folder off of this, off of this um, web browser. Let me see if there's a, you know, you, you'd be sitting there going. So um, Derb and GoBuster allow you to enumerate that process to see um, based on a common word list, um, you know, what um, URLs um, are available for you to be able to take a look into. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, very, very good. Thank you so much. Very clear. Oh, you're, you're welcome. All right. So any other questions? Nope, well set. All right, cool. Um, so as always, you can drop into the Slack if you have any um, questions or if you get stuck. Um, I included the instructions into the um, in the file for you to be able to do the things. Um, and I've told you, for example, if you needed to download something, um, if you need to download something, make sure that you put your machine back into um, net network mode so that you can make sure that you're actually connecting. So like I said, like we saw, you know, I couldn't actually scan this because it wasn't um, attached to the, um, you know, it was outward facing and not, um, it wasn't outward facing, that's what it was. So just make sure that after you download whatever it is that you need to get, whether it's a W get, whether, regardless of whatever it is, that afterwards you put your machine back onto the network because otherwise you'll have um, additional issues. All right, but I will catch you guys in the Slack and I will talk to you next week. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good night. Good night.